All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Brown, and uh, I work for Pivotal. I work on the Grails development team, so I spend most of my time helping build, uh, build the Grails framework. And uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, this afternoon, this is kind of light and kind of fun stuff, but there's also some, some, uh, some, some really interesting technical details that I want to tease out here. But uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Polyglot web development with Grails 2, and uh, we'll get a sense for what some of that looks like and uh, what that means. And uh, uh, as I said, there's, there's several pieces of, uh, of interesting uh, technology to talk about with, with respect to this. So let's just jump right in. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to, to start with is uh, agreeing on what kind of polyglot programming uh, I'm talking about. So polyglot programming is, is programming with multiple languages, right? And some folks say that if you're building a, a web app for the a JVM web app, you're doing polyglot development, right? You're, probably, you're using HTML and probably using CSS and maybe SQL or HQL and you're writing Java code or Groovy code. So already you've got four or five programming languages there, and that's uh, that's fair enough. That's uh, that's that's a kind of polyglot programming, but uh, that's not what what I want to uh, explore here. I want to talk about writing uh, maybe significant pieces of, of logic in your application in uh, in different programming languages. So so the kind of polyglot programming that I'm going to talk about uh, doesn't include uh, CSS and HTML and SQL and things like that. Um, that, that's not the kind of polyglot programming that I want to talk about. So there's a quote here from Wikipedia that uh, uh, is, is one reasonable definition of, of polyglot programming. So it turns out that the JVM is, uh, uh, is, is very well suited for, for doing polyglot uh, development. There are a whole bunch of programming languages that, uh, that target the JVM. Um, so, so I guess to back up a little bit before that, um, there are lots of good reasons that, uh, that, that we want to deploy applications to the JVM. There's lots of uh, operational stuff. That, that there are just lots of good reasons to de deploy apps to the JVM. And if to do that, you had to write your applications in Java and only Java, uh, maybe that would be manageable, but that would be uh, sub-ideal, right? That's, that's not really the best situation. And it turns out that uh, the JVM is, is, uh, is really well suited for doing polyglot development. You can use uh, uh, potentially lots of programming languages um, in, your, in your programs on the JVM. It turns out that there are hundreds of programming languages that target the JVM. Uh, lots of those languages are like someone's thesis work from university and, and uh, not something that you're, you're, you're going to use for, for, for serious development. But even if you narrow that list of hundreds down to the uh, real programming languages that are, that are suitable for building you know, serious applications at uh, wherever it is that you work, there's still maybe 10 or 12, something like that, different programming languages uh, available on the JVM. Uh, of course, Java is, uh, is an option. Groovy has uh, a whole bunch of compelling features that make it, um, uh, that make it, make it an interesting choice for, for web apps and for, for lots of apps in general. Uh, Groovy is really a, a, a really powerful, flexible, general purpose, dynamic programming language for the JVM. So most folks at this conference are already on board with that, and I, I probably don't need to spend a whole lot of time selling the idea that Groovy is, uh, that there are good reasons you might want to use Groovy, so, uh, so I won't. Um, but there are lots of other languages available for the JVM, right? Clojure is a really interesting language that targets the JVM. Clojure is a Lisp, right, and uh, it has... Uh, uh, really a bunch of, of compelling features. Um, it's really well suited for dealing with uh, concurrency problems, right? By default, closure things are immutable, right? You can mutate things in closure, but you, you have to go out of your way to do that. You, you have to kind of be explicit and say, okay, I'm over here in danger land now. I'm going to mutate some stuff, and uh, I understand the implications of that, which is really the opposite of what Groovy and Java and, and OO developers in general are, are used to dealing with, right? OO uh, in languages like Ruby and Java says that uh, mutability is the default, right? When you write a class and declare some properties in that class, the instances of that class are mutable, right? You get getters and setters by default in Groovy, uh, as an example. Uh, and you have to go out of your way to express that uh, uh, you want things to be immutable. So it's kind of the oppos opposite approach, right? Closure embraces immutability. That's just one uh, particular aspect of closure that's, uh, that's interesting for certain kinds of problems that turn up in applications. So, so maybe you've got an application that uh, you've got uh, really good reasons to want to write that application in Groovy, and, and uh, so, so you're going to do that. Maybe you're going to use the Grails framework and build this, uh, 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 build this uh, primarily Groovy uh, web application. But there's some part of the application that has concurrency concerns, or, or some part of the application that can take advantage of something that Clojure has to offer that maybe is uh, a better solution for, for that particular subset of problems than Groovy is. 
if you had to, to sort of approach that situation and say, okay, well, I can either use Groovy and all the stuff that his, it has to offer and then maybe not be able to deal with this concurrency problem very well, or I can forego Groovy and take on Clojure, uh, which is going to solve this, this particular subset of my problems really well, but then I have to give up, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to use Groovy. If you had to choose between them, uh, that, that wouldn't be good, right? But that's uh, what we're talking about is not having to make that choice, right? Being able to write your application primarily in Groovy as an example, and then if there's some part that you want to write in Clojure, you can do that. And if there's some part that you wanted to write in Scala, for example, you can do that. Um, you can even use JRuby inside of Grails if you want. Um, so there are lots of languages that target the JVM, and it turns out that if you develop a programming language today, it's a language that, uh, uh, that, that doesn't even exist. You develop a new programming language today and provide some way to call that programming language from Java. Just provide some way to call into your code from Java. If you do that, the stuff that we're about to look at here, so, so we're going to look at some examples specifically that relate to closure. But we could use basically the same approach that's used to uh, support closure in a Grails application to support uh, whatever programming language it is that, that you might develop today. Without making any changes at all to Grails, we could use your, your new programming language inside of Grails using the same technique that, I'm gonna, uh, that we'll look at here, uh, which is what Grails uses to provide access to closure. So th that'll make a little bit more sense when we get into some of the details and see what that looks like. But there are lots of, lots of languages that target the JVM. They've all got some reason for existence, right? They all have, there, there are compelling things about all these languages. Maybe you want to use, uh, you want to build a Grails, applications, uh, a Grails application and uh, you want to take advantage of closure for some s small part of your app, you, you can do that. It turns out that works, uh, works out really well. Uh, so just quickly, I want to talk uh, about uh, the Grails framework and um, I'll provide just a really quick overview here. Grails is a, a full stack web platform. It's a full stack framework. Uh, so it's got a build system, an ORM tool, a DI container, uh, all the stuff that, that's common to, uh, if you're going to build a, a web application, you're going to want all those kinds of things, a logging framework. So when you're, you're building Grails applications, Grails is a, a full stack platform that provides solutions for all those problems. So one of the things you're not doing when you build a Grails app is uh, starting with Grails and then adding Hibernate and then adding Spring and adding all the, so Grails bundles all this stuff up in a way that makes it, uh, uh, provides good default implementations for solutions for all those common problems that show up in, in web applications. And to do that, Grails leverages lots of proven staples out there, right? So we use Spring for dependency injection and transaction management, and really we use Spring for lots and lots of things in the framework. Uh, by default, Hibernate is used for uh, persistence, and if that's not what you want, uh, for whatever reason, maybe you're not talking to a relational database, right? So Hibernate is an ORM tool. It's for mapping your object model to a relational database and works, in general, works really, really well for that. But if you're not dealing with a relational database, maybe you want to use MongoDB, um, you're not stuck, right? That's not a dead end. You can pull the Hibernate plugin out and replace it with a MongoDB plugin and then go about your business. And to a large extent, a lot of the code that you would have written in your Grails application that worked with Hibernate will also work with MongoDB, just because of the way the, the GORM plugin stuff works. But the plugin system is an important part of uh, making that, that possible, but it's also an important part of what we're going to talk about uh, we'll see what, what, uh, how the, what role the plugin system plays in polyglot development, but it turns out the plugin system is an important part of that. Uh, so, so this is just a, a list of some of the key technologies that are in that, uh, uh, that, that list of best of breed things that I mentioned earlier, right? We use Spring for DI and Hibernate for ORM. Uh, Groovy is, is a, the thread that ties all this stuff together. So, so Grails pulls together these kind of best of breed solutions for lots of common problems and and this is a visual representation of, of kind of how this lays out. This is all happening on top of the JVM. Uh, of course, if you're targeting any platform other than the JVM, Grails isn't going to help you with that. Grails specifically targets the JVM. And that layer of technologies there that includes Spring and Hibernate and SiteMesh and Log4j, and there's a, there, there are others that aren't represented in the graphic there. And Grails is built on top of all of that stuff. And, uh, and Groovy is kind of the thread that we use to, to tie all that together. Uh, so we've got this really powerful platform, right? The JVM is a really flexible, powerful platform. There are lots of compelling reasons that we might want target to the, target the JVM. Um, and in, on, one of the things that uh, is compelling about the JVM is that we've got lots of language options, right? We can use Clojure, Groovy, and Java, and Scala, and so forth. 
Uh, we've got this, uh, this uh, a really great web framework uh, in Grails, and we want to be able to tie all this stuff together, right? I want to be able to use Clojure and Grails a as an example, and then that's the specific example that I'm going to drill into this afternoon. So let's uh, s start looking at some code. So when we look at this, so this is a controller uh, that's actually using the older controller syntax, but this is a controller in a Grails application. Um, so how many programming languages are at play here? Just shout out a number. How many programming languages do you think are involved in this code? I heard some two. I heard Groovy, right? So there's at least one, right? We're looking at Groovy code. Any others? So part of the answer is we don't know, right? You don't know from looking at this how many programming languages are involved, and that's, that's important. Uh, so we've got Groovy code, right? We're looking at Groovy code here, so that, that's at least one programming language. Um, params is an object that's available in all of your controllers in Grails, so you don't declare it or initialize it, it's, it's just there. And it turns out that that is an instance of a class called uh, Grails parameter map, and Grails parameter map uh, uh, could be written in Java. Right? So we're interacting with that thing in a way that uh, wouldn't change if the programming language that was used to write that class changed. So for example, if Grails parameter map was written in, in Java, this code could work. And then if we rewrote Grails parameter map in Groovy, this code could still work. Right? It's just params.getint. And uh, the point that I want to make there is from this perspective, I don't have to know or care about what programming language params was written in. I'm writing Groovy code as the author of this controller, and I know there's this thing called params, and I know it's got uh, some methods on it like getInt as an example. So I can call getInt and pass in a string, and I know what to expect to get back. So I have to understand kind of the contract for how this thing behaves. But what I don't have to know is uh, what, what are the uh, implementation details inside of the getInt method. So how does the getInt method do whatever it does? And I also don't have to, not only do I not have to know the implementation details of, of how the getInt method is implemented, I don't even have to know what programming language it was written in. Could be written in any of a number of languages. I don't have to, to know or care about that as the author of this code. And, that, and that's an important part, an important point. Uh, the next line of code there that says mathhelper.addNumbers. So mathhelper could be written in Java or Clojure or Groovy. I can't tell from looking at this, at this particular code what language was used to author the math helper. I, don't, I just know that there's a thing called math helper and that it's got a method called add numbers and I pass in some parameters and I know what to expect to get back, but I don't, I don't know or care what language it was written in, right? That's, and that, that's a good thing. So it might be written in Java, right? Here is a, Java, a math helper that's written in Java. Uh, we've got a, a method called add numbers that accepts some parameters, adds them together and returns their sum. So this is what a Java math helper might look like, right? Or maybe the thing was written in Groovy. Uh, for, for a simple class like this, there's not a, a whole lot of differences between the Java and, and Groovy implementations. Again, we've got a class that's written in, uh, uh, in Groovy in this case. Uh, the, the class defines a method called add numbers that accepts a couple of parameters. In this case, they're dynamically typed. Uh, they could be statically typed if that's what I wanted. Uh, the method accepts a couple of parameters, adds them together, and returns the result of that. Right, so we've got a Java math helper that looks like this, a Groovy math helper that looks like this, and the code that's interacting with the math helper here would look exactly the same for both of those scenarios. Right? This code doesn't change. Uh, it's the same code if the math helper is Java or if the math helper is Groovy. Or maybe the math helper is something more fundamentally different than the two options that we look at there. Maybe it's written in closure. Right? So here we've got a, a function written in, in closure that's called add numbers. The function accepts a couple of parameters and returns the sum of those parameters. This is effectively doing the same thing that the other two implementations are doing. The syntax is just more radically different, but it's doing the same thing. And it could be that back here in this controller, when I refer to mathhelper.addNumbers, that I'm really calling this closure function. Again, the, uh, one of the important points here is I don't know or care from this perspective. Any comments or questions about any of that so far? No? Good? All right. So let's, uh, let's take a look at some of this in real code and see what we can, uh, what we can come up with. So I'm going to fill in some details in our um, controller action here. I'm going to forego interacting with the params object. I'll just have the values of x and y passed in as uh, arguments to my uh, controller action. So we'll say render 
the sum of x and y is sum. All right. So when this, when this controller action is executed, uh, it expects there to be a, a request parameter called x and a request parameter called y. And uh, it's going to add those together and uh, uh, render the sum. Get out here. Yeah. All right. Let's start that application up. I'm going to add a URL mapping to make that easier to interact with. Say add numbers. X, Y. Uh, my controller is called demo. And what was the action called? I think it was called add. Yeah, add is good. There we go. No, the controller action. Oh, I, did I type add numbers? I meant to type just add. There we go. The controller action is called add. Right, this is the name that I'm after here. Uh, in the URL, I put add numbers there, but uh, th those two are separate things, right? Let me start our application up, see what we get. So if I send a request to slash add numbers slash four slash seven, what should happen is this controller action should be executed, and it's going to do some work and uh, render a result. Turns out that the, the work it's doing is not particularly interesting, but it, it's enough to support where we want to go with this. All right. Get our browser up and running here. Add numbers slash four slash nine. There we go. That says the sum of four and nine is thirteen. All right. So we've got a we've got a good starting point here. Uh, so let's imagine that uh, addition is complicated, right? This, so in our the problem that we're solving here is we're just taking two numbers and adding them together. Uh, we've got a, a more complicated problem that we want to solve, like amortizing a loan or, or doing something complicated, and I don't want that complexity. In this, uh, in this controller. I want to get that complexity out someplace else, and I want to keep this controller uh, pretty simple. So one thing I could do is something like this. All right. so if I stopped uh, our app and started it back up, uh, is that going to work? Anyone think it's going to work? It's not going to work. Uh, it's going to throw a null pointer exception. Right? Because I've got this uh, property here called math helper, and I never initialized it to anything. And when this uh, controller action is executed, I'm invoking a method on that reference. The reference is uninitialized, so we'll get an NPE. That's not good. But what I want to do is uh, we want to create source groovy com demo. All right. All I did there was uh, created uh, an empty directory. Source groovy com demo. Right here, I'm going to create a new file that I'll call uh, Groovy Math Helper. That looks good. We'll say def uh, add numbers x and y, return the sum of those numbers. All right, so now I've got a class called Groovy Math Helper. Uh, it's got a method in it called add numbers that uh, looks like what you see there. This is still not going to work, right? If I start the application up and uh, send a request to this controller action, math helper is still going to be null, so we'll get an NPE there. Uh, so the one last piece of the puzzle that I can fill in here is we can add a bean to our Spring application context called math helper and do that. Let me start the oops, start the application back up. So all I've done is added a bean to the Spring application context called math helper. And the bean will be an instance of this class, which is the class that I just wrote, Groovy Math Helper, right? So there's a bean in the application context. Uh, the bean name is Math Helper. And in my controller, I've got a uh, property whose name matches that bean, and all the magic uh, auto wiring stuff that Grails provides will happen there. Uh, I see I've got a typo right there. Um, so by the time this controller action executes, Math Helper should be initialized with an instance of Groovy Math Helper. One thing I don't want to do is this, right? I don't want to say groovy math helper. I don't want to initialize that thing like that. I could, and it would, it would function. But now my, my demo controller is uh, explicitly coupled to the groovy math helper class. So now if I come up with a reason that uh, math is better to implement in Java, and I write a Java math helper, I have to come back here and change this code. That, that's not good. That's not what I want, right? I, I just want to know, as the author of this controller, I just want to know that there is a thing called math helper. 
I don't know what, it's, what, what uh, language it was written in. I don't know the name of the class. I don't need to know any of that stuff. I just know there's a bean called Math Helper, and it can help me solve problems like adding numbers together. So let's see what we get there. Uh, I'm missing, my, I've got a typo there. N-U-M-B-E-R-S, that looks right. I don't think that had recompiled. This is telling me I, I can't call add N-U-B-M-E-R-S, and uh, that was a typo I had here before the class was compiled. But uh, when the application starts back up, that will work. I think it'll work. And what's happening is the controller action is interacting with uh, an instance of this Groovy Math Helper class, but there's no mention of the Groovy Math Helper class, of course, in that controller. There we go. So I'm 13, so that, that, uh, that appears to be working, right? Uh, so now, and I won't go through the process of, uh, of, uh, of writing the code, but I could create a new math helper called the Java math helper, write it in Java, and then go edit my resources.groovy and make the math helper being an instance of the Java math helper instead of the Groovy math helper, and this code doesn't change at all. This code still works. As long as the behavior of the add numbers method is the same, this, this code doesn't have to change, and that's good. Uh, let's take another more interesting step with this. And instead of implementing our math helper like that, let's just do that. And we'll get back to, we're going to come back to that CLJ property and what that, we'll, we'll, we'll be back to that momentarily here. I'm going to create a new file out here under source slash CLJ. And I can call it anything. I'll call it math.clj. And I'm going to define a function here called add numbers x and y and have this return the sum of those numbers. That looks right, okay. So the, the first, and if you don't know Clojure, uh, no problem at all. It's, uh, we're not gonna write any more Clojure code than you see right here. Uh, but all this is, is we're declaring a function. Defin is, uh, means define function. Uh, we're defining a function called add numbers. This is the parameter list, and this is the implementation of the function, simply returning, turning the sum of the, the two parameters. Now, our controller, right now, where that says clj.addNumbers, somehow that's gonna end up invoking this, uh, this closure function. Let me start our application back up and we'll see that in action. Uh, so right now, we'll, we'll get to a point where we, we could come back to having math helper here if we wanted. Uh, we'll get to that, but for now, uh, I'm not interacting with a math helper. I'm interacting with a thing called clj and invoking a method on it, uh, or it looks like I'm invoking a method on it and somehow that method call is going to end up executing this, this closure code over here. So we do that, it looks like it's working. To establish that, we'll go edit this, and we'll add another thousand to the, uh, to the number. Reload. We get an error over here, let me restart that and see. That should have reloaded, but it didn't. But uh, I'm confident, we'll, we'll verify this in just a moment, but this, this function really should be executing right now. And this controller, yeah, CLJ, I expect that once the application comes back, we'll see 1,013 there. There we go, 1,013, so it, it did in fact work. So that, that is executing this, uh, this closure code right here. Uh, so there are several pieces of this that uh, we need to explore and figure out. One is, uh, what is this CLJ thing, right? So we don't see something like this. We don't have a, a property called CLJ declared up here, and we don't, don't want that and don't need that. Uh, we don't have a bean over here called CLJ. In fact, we could get rid of this altogether. With our current implementation, we don't need the math helper at all. But somehow this CLJ thing is, uh, appears in our controller. And uh, I can interact with that in a certain way. And that certain way is I can invoke methods on it and somehow uh, that will end up executing a function whose name matches that method name, a closure function whose name matches the method name. So let's uh, figure out how some, of that, how some of that works. If we look in my build config file, uh, ahead of time I had added this to my build config in the Grails app. So that says I've got a dependency on version 0.7 of the, uh, of the closure plugin, right? So this is, uh, by default, this line of code is not in your build config file. You have to express explicitly that you, your application is gonna use closure. So I've expressed that uh, this application is using the closure plugin, and the closure plugin, one of the things that it does is it makes this CLJ property available in all of your controller classes. In fact, I think it adds it to all of your classes. We'll, we'll see in just a moment. And what the CLJ property is, is it's a thing whose type you don't care about, but uh, its behavior you do. And its behavior is what we see here. And that is you call a method on it, 
whose name corresponds to a closure function, and this thing will, th that thing that CLJ is an instance of will take care of um, making it all happen. So let's take a look at how some of that works. So we're looking at the source code for the closure plugin itself. So we're outside of our application now. We're looking at the, the, the plugin code itself. And there's a, there's a bunch of stuff here that's a distraction that uh, I'm going to do some hand waving over and just focus on the parts that, that are relevant to what, what I want to talk about. So one of the things that the, the closure plugin does is what you see here. It creates an instance of this class called uh, grails.closure.closureProxy, right? So uh, we're creating an instance of the closure proxy class. And what this is, if we, we navigated around uh, the code above this, what we, we'd see is classes is, uh, we'll just say that it's all the classes in our Grails application. Strictly speaking, that's not true, but let's just, uh, we'll just say that. Classes is all the classes in my Grails app. And what this is doing is grabbing all of the meta classes for all of those classes. And for every one of them, we're using Groovy's uh, dynamic uh, runtime metaprogramming uh, uh, capabilities to add a method and I'll just hard code this to CLJ for now. It's configurable, so you can put up a, a define a property in your config prop in your config.groovy file that controls this method name. But for simplicity, we'll just hard code it to be get CLJ for now. So now all classes in your Grails application are going to have a method called get CLJ. Get CLJ. And what the get CLJ method does is it simply returns uh, the value of this uh, uh, of this local variable here. So calling get CLJ from a controller will execute this code and will result in, uh, will evaluate to this thing, which is an instance of the closure proxy class. So if we go back to our application code now, I'm not out of the plugin, I'm in the application code. Uh, I could call get CLJ, right, if I just wanted to do that, because, but because of Groovy's property access stuff, this makes more sense. So CLJ actually calls get CLJ. And whatever's returned from get CLJ, I'm invoking this add numbers method. So back into the plugin now, the thing that's returned from get CLJ is, is proxy. Proxy is an instance of this. Uh, but surely there is no method in the closure proxy class called add numbers, right? That doesn't make sense. That, that's a, a function name that I made up as the application developer here. I could have called this anything, right? So there's no method in the closure proxy class called get CLJ, but somehow this code works. So let's look at the closure proxy class and, and explore that a little bit. This is the closure proxy class. And again, I'm going to do some hand waving over the, the parts that are not relevant to the, the points I want to focus on. Um, but there is a method missing method inside of closure proxy. Uh, so those of you who are, for those of you who were in uh, uh, the runtime metaprogramming talk that I did earlier today uh, are maybe familiar with this. But for those who are not, uh, in Groovy, when you invoke a method on an object, if the method does not exist, uh, normally you'll get a missing method exception will be thrown. So if you create a string and invoke a method called Jeff, you're going to get a missing method exception because there is no method called Jeff in, in the string class. Um, so what happens by default when you invoke a method that does not exist is a missing method exception will be thrown. But one of the things that might happen before an exception would be thrown is Groovy will look to see if the, the object that you're invoking the method on, it will look to see if that object's class has a method missing method in it, a method with this signature. Right? It has to be public, has to return object, has to be called method missing. Um, if that method missing method exists, then instead of throwing an exception, Groovy will invoke, Groovy's uh, runtime uh, method dispatch mechanism will invoke this method. And now you get to do whatever you want in this code, right? And what this code is doing is intercepting that call to a method that doesn't exist. So remember, the method that we're after is a method called add numbers. Add numbers is the name of the method that was invoked. And this is the a bit I want to do some hand waving over. That's the closure specific stuff. But what that what that code is doing is reaching out to the closure runtime and finding a function whose name matches this method name. So it's finding a function whose name is add numbers. That's all we need to know about that code. And then that function gets executed. And whatever that function returns is returned from method missing. So back here in our application, when I call clj.addNumbers, clj is an instance of closure proxy. Uh, I'm invoking the addNumbers method, which doesn't exist on closure proxy. I'm invoking addNumbers on that thing. Because I'm invoking a method that doesn't exist, this method missing gets executed. And what the method missing is doing is going out to find a function in the closure runtime called addNumbers and that, that function gets executed, right? 
Uh, this is the, the function in our case. Does that make sense? Any comments or questions about that? Good, all right. Uh, so from back here in our applications, fr from the applications perspective, again, I, I don't know, so this happens to be called CLJ, so there's a hint there that it's closure, but this property could be called anything, right? There's a configuration, uh, there's a property you can define in config.groovy, so I could say, uh, whatever the name of the property is, closure.variable.name equals math helper. So now this would be math helper, right? Instead of CLJ, just the default name is uh, CLJ, so that's what you get. When I wrote this uh, function, I declared it to be in the, uh, the Grails namespace. So namespaces uh, in Clojure are similar to packages in Java, right? So in, in Java or Groovy. So in Java or Groovy, when you declare a class, uh, most often you're going to put those classes in a package. That package is really just a namespace. So you could have com.demo.groovymathhelper, and you could have com.great.groovymathhelper. You could have different Groovy Math Helper classes as long as they're in different packages. In fact, there are uh, numerous occurrences of that sort of thing happening with core JDK classes, right? There's java.util.list, which is a collection class, and there's java.awt.list, which is a GUI list thing. Um, so it's okay to have classes with different names as long as they're in separate packages. And the same is true of, of closure functions. You can have uh, an add numbers function in one namespace and an add numbers function in another namespace. Uh, the, the way the, the plugin is, is authored is it assumes that your functions are in a namespace called Grails, and that's what's expressed right here. NS, Grails, that's how you express, that's how you express a namespace in, in Clojure. But maybe I've got numerous add numbers methods, and one of them is in the math namespace, and one is in some other namespace. I could have any number of add numbers methods as long as they're all in unique namespaces. And the way to express which one of those I want to interact with is if I use this syntax, what happens is uh, that's going to look for the add numbers function in the Grails namespace. That's the default namespace. And if you wanted to access the add numbers function in some other namespace, uh, that's the way to do that. Right? So CLJ and then in square brackets, sub math. So the math in that on line six there is specifying a namespace. This is implicit, right? There's really no reason to put Grails in there, but you could, then it would work. And the way that's working is uh, if we look back here in our closure proxy class, uh, let's look at this first. So this, if I said def something equals CLJ Grails, that is the same as saying get at Grails, right? So this is groovy syntax for calling get at. So apparently there's a get at method on the closure proxy class that, that does something useful with respect to this. So if we look at our closure proxy class, here it is. All right, so there is a get at method. So when you do this sort of thing, right, CLJ sub Grails, this gets executed. And what this is doing is creating a new closure proxy class, not the one that you're interacting with, but a, but a new one. And its namespace will be whatever argument was passed to the get at method. So in this case over here, the namespace will be Grails, which is the default, right? Or like that, and it would be math. Uh, and then this NS property, which is declared inside the closure proxy, uh, here you can see it, this is where it's hard coded to default to Grails, but that NS property is referred to down here when we go to reach out to the closure runtime to find a function with a certain name. We're saying find the function whose name is add numbers and whose namespace is this, right? Which is the, that's the namespace we were just talking about setting. So by default, the namespace would be Grails, but you get to specify you know, an, another namespace if that's what you want. So if we, that's the syntax we would use if we wanted to uh, invoke the add numbers function from the math namespace, right? So several pieces of that are design decisions that were made by the plugin author, right? Uh, so I happened to, to, to write the plugin, but there are several things about that that could have been implemented differently, right? One thing that uh, 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 could have been done that would have made this maybe a little more consistent with the way uh, a lot of other things in Grails work, is instead of adding this CLJ property to all classes, so instead of adding get CLJ to all of your classes, uh, one thing the plugin could have done was instead add a bean to the Spring application context called CLJ. So now you do something like that, and the rest of the code stays the same. Right? We'll get rid of the namespace because we're using the default namespace. That would work, 
because there would be a bean in the spring application context called CLJ. And uh, had it been implemented that way, we probably would have done the same, a uh, similar thing to what was actually done. That is, you could define a property which declares what that bean name would be. So if you wanted the property to be called math helper, that would get you back to a syntax that looks like this. So now what you could do is you could declare a math helper bean like this, or the math helper bean could be com.demo.java math helper, or you could forego this altogether and have the closure plugin uh, do its thing, which would be the closure plugin could add a bean to the spring application context called math helper and get the same effect without having to explicitly register the bean. Turns out the, the plugin doesn't behave that way because I felt like this just doesn't really add anything. Why should I have to declare that property uh, when I can just skip that step, right? So the property that's added to all the artifacts is uh, by default called CLJ, but that's, uh, that's configurable. But spring is not involved in any of that. So uh, back to a, a comment I made earlier. If you write a programming language later today and provide some way to call that language from Java, then an approach very similar to this could be used, right? So uh, instead of this code, which goes out to the groovy run or the closure runtime to find uh, closure functions, this would be whatever Java code or whatever groovy code it takes to call into your programming language from groovy, right? So there's no mention at all of closure anywhere in the, Grails, in the Grails code base, right? In Grails core, no mention of closure at all. But uh, it, it turns out we can interact with closure in a really seamless, in a seamless way, which, which is what's being demonstrated here. And the same is true for lots of JVM programming languages. Uh, as I said, there's a Scala plugin, uh, there's a closure plugin, and uh, if more compelling programming languages come along in the future, uh, we, we may add similar support for, you know. Uh, whatever programming languages evolve later. So powerful, flexible stuff. Comments or questions about any of that? Good. Uh, so we end up with this uh, situation where we get to take advantage of all the great stuff that Grails has to offer. Lots of compelling things uh, are, are on offer from, from the Grails framework. There are lots of reasons that uh, you might want to take advantage of Grails. Uh, there are lots of reasons you might want to take advantage of, uh, of Clojure or Scala, and you get to, uh, uh, you get to, to combine those things and take advantage of uh, the best parts of all of them. Uh, so who really gets the credit for that? And uh, the answer is really all of these things, right? The Grails framework is doing a lot to make it uh, really easy to do that sort of thing. The, the plugin that we just looked at took uh, maybe uh, two or three hours to write, and the first two and a half hours of that was just learning the Clojure API. It didn't have anything to do with Groovy or, or, uh, or Grails. Uh, but not very much effort went into make, making, that, making that happen. Uh, and the Grails plugin system is what, what made that so easy to do. Uh, Groovy makes all of that possible, right? All the, the really cool stuff that you can do inside of Grails, like adding methods to classes at runtime and intercepting calls to methods that don't exist. Uh, those are fundamental to the behavior that, that we just, just looked at. Groovy makes all that stuff possible. Uh, Clojure uh, is uh, this really compelling language, and they provided a way to call into that language from Java, so we get to, to do the sorts of things we're looking at here. All these things are really conspiring to create uh, this environment that's just uh, uh, really flexible and offers lots and lots of possibilities. Right? Uh, so we've already looked at this demo. So any questions at all, comments about any of that stuff? Anything at all that I can answer? Yeah. Yeah, the question, the question or uh, I guess it wasn't phrased as a question, it was an assertion that uh, calling your groovy code from closure might be uh, more, uh, uh, less slick than this. Was that something like the comment? Uh, so the comment is, uh, your closure code should be compiled before your Groovy code. And I would ask, uh, why is that? Well, why, why do you think that's a good idea? I, so I'll disagree. Uh, so in fact, the closure code is not compiled before the Groovy code. And you can use it from Groovy, uh, as we just demonstrated. And uh, we could also go in the other direction. So from the closure code, I could make calls back into Groovy land if I wanted. So Clojure has a, a, dot, a syntax for using the dot operator. Uh, so inside of this Clojure code, I could create instances of Groovy classes that are part of my application. I could create an instance of the Groovy math helper here if I wanted and have the Clojure code delegate to that. Uh, so absolutely, I can make calls in both directions here. 
I'll be happy to uh, work that up for you. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll do that when we're done here. But yeah, so Groovy, uh, Clojure provides a mechanism for calling into any objects. It doesn't matter what language they're written in. So the syntax I would use to do that, uh, to call into Groovy code from Clojure, is the exact same syntax I would use to call into Java code from Clojure. Okay. Well, this never gets executed until runtime. Okay. So but by runtime, your Groovy code is compiled. So we can, we can look at that and I'll, I'll, we can demonstrate that if you like. But absolutely, we can make calls into Groovy code from, uh, from our closure code. Any other comments? Is that good? All right, I think I'm the only thing between you and beer, so I will get out of the way. So thank you all very much. <laughs>